Good morning, and what a lovely theater this is. And I thank you also for the wonderful introduction to Los Angeles's world-class traffic. <laughs> uh, I tell you. And also, uh, to Sean, um, I think a phrase crept into mind is that we've reached the stage of a marvelous indifference about synesthesia, that it simply is. And then we explore its marvelous nuances and wonders and all that. Now, a standard dismissal of synesthetes of, uh, as bogus is that they're just being metaphoric. <clears throat> But this is circular reasoning because it's just replacing one enigma with another because we don't yet know the neural underpinnings of metaphor, which I call seeing the similar in the dissimilar. It does not want to cooperate. So um, here's my latest book. Uh, officially out in February as part of MIT Press's Essential Knowledge series. It's the source of infor it's, a, it's the source for those who want, quote, more information. Uh, the book that brings the latest information up to date and speaks to my topic today, metaphor. Now, MIT Press has uh, just made some flyers here which are outside that you can get. You can pre-order this on Amazon if you like. Um, so metaphors, how are different things alike when a synesthete says, I know it's two because it's white? What does it mean when Shakespeare says, it is the east and Juliet is the sun? And what perceptual identity is implied when someone says, she had a green name? Standard metaphor theory imagines an abstract link between different concepts. Somehow, through semantics, Yellow is warm, green is cool. Where the wine might be? Keyboard doesn't want to actively try that. Nope. I'll have to use go the old fashioned way. You know, but these thermal analogies are physically based, they're not semantic. Uh, for more than a century, we've known that orderly and lawful correspondences exist between different dimensions of perception. And that's why it makes sense to say that the sound of a piccolo is bright, high, and small, while that of a kettle drum or a, or a gong is low, dark, and big. Even, come on you, there we go. Chefs and psychologists both know that uh, even flavor maps to high, low, and bright, dark dimensions. We say that a darkly tinted liquid smells and tastes stronger than its equivalent pale version, while the unsuspecting say that white wine, surreptitiously colored red, tastes and smells like red wine. Remember mom scolding you for saying that your eyes were bigger than your stomach? Well, we do eat with our eyes. We say, this looks delicious, never the future-oriented, this is going to taste great. So chefs emphasize the visual, but quite often, sometimes emulating art. A still life here, perhaps, oh, why is my, yeah, there we go. Perhaps an homage to, uh, on, uh, to uh, Mondrian uh, and this carnal plate at the, on top there, obviously inspired by Damien Hirst. Now, I've argued that there isn't anything abstract about metaphor. Quite the opposite. Me metaphor would not be possible without first being able to grasp perceptual similarities such as dark is also strong. Perceptual similarities <clears throat> give way to synesthetic equivalences such as I know it's two because it's white. These then evolve into spatial metaphors such as good is up, bad is down or ontological metaphors such as ideas are light. Language then elaborates these fundamental metaphors into phrases such as brilliant, that was a bright idea, or I see what you're saying. Now, does evolution keep overt synesthesia high at 4% of the population because its propensity to hyperconnect 
supports metaphor and makes us more creative as a species? Does it bestow the ability to see the similar in the similar, the similar in the dissimilar? Even four-year-olds whose language is rudimentary understand synesthetic metaphors such as warm and cool colors. Consider too the excruciating specificity of synesthetes. In this study, they use 54 terms to describe a green compared to only five terms used by control subjects. As Sir Francis Galton remarked over a century ago, they are never satisfied, with, he said, with saying blue, but will take a great deal of trouble to express or match the particular blue that they mean. So having synesthesia requires two things, a genetic propensity to hyperconnect different brain areas and cultural or early childhood cultural exposure to uh, artifacts such as alphabets, foods names, calendars, clocks, and so on. Some think that grapheme color synesthesia, uh, that the couplings occur in the course of learning how to read when children come to master what green things are, grass, peas, trees, crayons, money, construction paper. They engage such objects physically and more importantly come to understand what they mean. They learn that G is a letter, that it's a consonant, that it can sound like G, group, George, go, gadget, go, and even the F in enough. And they also learn that it's green. Now what are, whatever exacting equivalences Whatever they are, they're quite meaningful, as Larry Mark showed decades ago. And to me, as a writer, a scientist, an artist, meaning is the key. So where does meaning arise from? From having a self-directed body that moves through its unique three-dimensional multisensory world, a world that's particular to each species. So for example, here is, here is objective reality. <clears throat> Uh, as we understand it. Well, this slice in the middle is uh, this infinitesimal is one tenth, one ten trillionth of the entire energy flux that exists. So, of all the flux that bombards us, radio waves, cosmic particles, cell phone conversations, they all pass through us unnoticed because we lack the biological sensors to know that they're there. This minuscule fraction constitutes our umwelt, a word that describes the bubble in which a given organism lives, the restricted envelope of its reality. So, for example, sonar defines the umwelt of bats and cetaceans. A dog's umwelt centers on smell, while insects and birds rely on ultraviolet and polarized light that we're not able to see. Reptiles navigate with infrared, sensed as heat, whereas deep sea creatures only know a high pressure, frigid realm devoid of light. So reality doesn't exist out here somewhere. It's in here and in here. In the silent darkness of your skull, the brain knows only the language of electrical impulses and chemical gradients. It weaves that inner cosmos into a story, the reality of your uniquely subjective world. So nerve impulses coming from the tongue, the eye, and the ear are no different from those coming from the big toe. Sensory substitution shows quite well that you can input anything into the brain and it figures it out. So that's why we can implant biologically alien technology in cochleas and retinas and give people everywhere vision and hearing. There is a catch, though. An embodied brain cannot possibly absorb downloaded knowledge the way that the Matrix films depict. Our brain is not a passive antenna waiting for signals to pass by. Rather, an embodied brain is an active explorer that seeks out what interests it. Think of a baby crawling, putting everything in its mouth, exploring in a visual and multi-sensory apprenticeship with the world as it strives to make sense of it, to discern what things it encounters mean. It sounds logical, except that our biologic brain can't take in the enormous energy flux hitting it every second. So in order not to be overwhelmed, it also has to be a strong filter. 
a paradox that lies behind the subjectively different points of view that each of us has. A Google Maps car plying the street records everything indiscriminately, while two people walking down the same street notice entirely different things which, with respect to shops, restaurants, passers-by. People have different perspectives. They're curious about different things, assign different values to what they encounter. So synesthesia shows that how embodied memory perception and metaphoric thinking support one another so that she had a green name makes sense. We understand cold heart without having to explicate the metaphor. And look at the bottom here, how we refer to memory entirely in metaphoric images. With memory, storage is not the limiting factor so much as retrieval is because what we take in and embody is first colored by context. It's then stored across multiple cortical repositories in a web of associations and then retrieved later on in yet different contexts so that each time we remember something, it's different. Every recollection reconstructs salient and meaningful details from the original event. And because current context shades it yet again, all memories are in some sense false. It sounds like Zen to say so, <clears throat> but it is all one. And this perspective happily gives us a different take on physical metaphors. Now, artist Marcos Luchens and I have become increasingly interested in visual metaphors, subject, object, encounters that don't need explanation in order to grasp their meaning. No conscious appraisal is needing. So visual design alone can sometimes motivate action. This shape says, kick me up, feel me, see how I nestle in your hand, feel my heft, all without needing words. Now by contrast, Dove's message didn't, was too explicit. Its campaign failed by making users confront their own body shape. I don't look like that, you know? Who here feels like any of these shapes except perhaps the, the thinnest runner, I guess? Now, tactile sound is the focus of the baselet, a wearable subwoofer. It's equivalent to a D-box movie seat on your forearm. And this device delivers the beats and the bass line to your body to let you literally feel the music. Of course, tactile sound has a long history. It's been used to pass up by babies since time immemorial, from the fremitus of a mother's lullaby to the latest vibrating bassinet. Now, this Huey ADA compliant system of fixtures and surfaces is a rather low level metaphor in which color induces action or identification. So where on this fire stairwell panic bar do you push? Well, you push on the green part, obviously. Users, users needn't pause to weigh a decision in order to open the door. The visual cue tells them what to do. And these kinds of cues are useful for those with reduced mental capacity. While their meaning is also clear, remains clear to those of us who are still compos mentis. Now this European bathroom is designed for demented individuals. Worldwide, 47 million people are demented, 10 million new cases introduced every year. And as part of this mental decline, they lose their spatial orientation. So a clearly structured environment like this, easily perceived, helps maintain orientation and independent. The permanent red surfaces facilitate perception of features within the room and understanding how to use them. So it's also the most easily, red is also the most easily perceived by individuals who are demented, and it's also the most easily perceived color by those who are losing their vision to let's say macular de degeneration or other age-related impairments. And so this dementia wash basin is suitable for people whose vision is declining as well. Now at LA's main museum, Marcos and I um, embarked on a project with director Allison Axton, and we call it a semantic survey of emotions. We wanted to know how people feel about certain colors, images, and concepts. It was a pilot project to ascertain what visitors are drawn to or not. And most participants were middle-aged, were middle about 30 to 55. So um, 286 visitors differentiated the semantic meaning of colored squares. 
1952, Charles Osgood invented a method for teasing out the meaning of anything. His semantic differential, which is what it's called, became a standard tool just as Stroop interference did. Anything can suffice as a stimulus. Words, music, colors, sonar signals, drum rhythms, pictures, doesn't matter. No matter what you use as a stimulus, all the variance of meaning distills down into just three factors. Activity. How, how lively is something? How animated or lively is it? Potency, how vigorous. Am I on the right slide here? Wait. Yeah, okay, potency, how vigorous or flabby is it? An evaluation, do we judge it in, a fa in favorable or negative terms? We also ask visitors to choose which among a set of parallel image, paired images best represented concepts, such as ease of access, cultural engagement, or evolved knowledge. Now, these are deliberately imprecise terms because what we were after was not rational meaning, but meaning as experienced, viscerally. We found that oppositional pairings, such as magenta versus this green, sparked the most interest among museum visitors. And the semantic di differential also found trends in um, ease of access or familiarity, cultural relevance and engagement, and emotional identification. The results signify that visitors' preference for comfort and familiarity. What they feel is culturally relevant is also identified as moving, fast, and non-threatening. And yet, paradoxically, this, these same respondents identified themselves as open to new experience, despite the heavy weighing of responses towards the evaluation access. So what visitors tend to do, more than anything else, is judge and weigh whatever they're encountering. Now, I'm now going to turn the floor over to Marcos, who will tell you more about the installation of Building Bridges and some of the other projects that we're, we're, we're working on. Um, in the future here. So, this, uh, I don't know why this is acting up, but I just touched the square and, and okay, make it, perfect. and then when the video comes, if there's a video, show it here and push the play button. Okay. So, all right, good luck. Thank you, thank you. So, uh, uh, just to kind of segue on as smoothly as possible, <laughs> um, many of you were probably at the Building Bridges exhibition last night, and there was an installation along the wall um, that was essentially a kind of tactile color installation. And um, apart from our conversations with Richard and uh, dialogue specifically about that, I just wanted to mention that uh, in the last 10, 15 years, I've been working uh, in the theme of kind of synesthetic or kind of cross-sensory exploration. And I'll just give a couple of examples. This was. Uh, called the Memory Observatory, and it was shown at South by Southwest. And the idea was that um, that uh, people would share uh, special memories, special photographs relating to memories, and they would be interviewed for five minutes, and then they would that would be in the small uh, kind of pyramid-like structure on the left, and then they go into the large structure on the right, which which was actually a kind of large. Um, kind of kaleidoscopic uh, space in which the the image, their photograph was projected in the screen above and then uh, color and smell and uh, sounds were orchestrated to match the emotions, the kind of emotional impact of those images. And it was, it was very touching actually. There was a lot of kind of um, emotional opening up and kind of tears, happy tears shared um, about kind of releasing these these uh, image. A lot of the images were like of family members that may have passed away, and so it was kind of recreating that 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 sensation through through kind of deeper access of moods through color and and smell and sounds. And um, part of that uh, association, we needed to kind of figure out a kind of algorithm uh, so that the people behind the curtain the operators of the sound and the smell and all that could could quickly establish what we were going for. And so what, what we developed was this uh, kind of enlarged version of, of psychologist Robert Plutchik's 
wheel, emotion wheel, which is color to emotion. And we kind of expanded it outwards, uh, working with uh, smell scientists, um, uh, associating color with, with smell and also sound, as in, for instance, uh, Minor, minor chords are usually associated with kind of darker or, or more uh, kind of angry, let's say, colors, and major chords are associated with kind of lighter, uh, happier moods. This wasn't necessarily created with synesthetes. It was, we were trying to find a kind of general rule, but s some of this maps into itself, for instance, the theory of music and film, um, you know, seems to overlap with a kind of general 